So good morning, it's a pleasure being here, first time in Perth, and um, the hotel seems very nice, I arrived last night, so I hope to get out and see some of the city later on today. So my name is Joshua Rothbart, I'm, our office is based in Hong Kong and Singapore, and as said, what we say, we help clients, mostly individuals, financial uh, um, investment companies, and family office buy, store, and, and uh, sell, and transport physical metals. But I'm here today more about talking about what some people think is the future of our industry, which is on the technological side, and something are still afraid of it, and that's the blockchain technology. So just personally, my interest started, I'm not a pioneer or anything, I'm not a tech guy, which is a good news for you, because not going to be too much heavy on the tech side, I'm a billion guy. But two years ago, our first client, one of our clients actually, the Australian guy, came to us and said, listen, I stole half a million dollar worth of bullion with you guys. I did it, I transacted you. There's this thing called Bitcoin, which I want to purchase. Can you procure that for us in the same manner you're doing the precious metals? I said, okay, I've just heard about it, you know, here and there. You wired us $5,000 and asked to buy five coins. Price it with about 1,000 US dollar per coin. And we started looking into this and how to do it and the exchanges and, and, and the problems and the issues. We did this transaction and then he bought $10,000 the next month and then we bought him a ledger and we start storing the ledger for this client. And they, actually the business starts growing and it's from clients that we realized that there's something that we should look into. So we look into that and the volume started going, going up and a year ago we opened a company that deals only with cryptocurrencies from an investment point of view through either exchange to gold or exchange to fiat, and we serve investors, we serve service providers, uh, we even have a, a real estate developer that get paid sometimes for client by three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar worth of property using cryptocurrencies. And we start looking into that and it became very interesting. So I always say, you know, our clients are very interesting entrepreneurs, very interesting uh, uh, leading people, and it's always good to listen to what they say because then you learn a lot, and that's what we did. So we started this two years ago, a year ago we opened the company and we start traveling around, speaking of cryptocurrency and, and blockchain conferences, talking about gold from a gold perspective. I'm going to talk about cryptocurrency specifically on Friday, but people in the crypto space are like, oh, come on, gold, it's, as people say, it's a relic, it's relevant, that's kind of the sentiment. But then something interesting happened when I started talking to my peers in the bullion industry, they were really like, oh, that's Ponzi scheme. We don't know anything about it. Uh, we're not sure how to deal with it, and so on. So the question is why? Why are we so afraid or, or, or uh, kind of uh, skeptical about this technology? And I think, first of all, in our industry, we're not big on tech. That's the, that's the first thing. Still, I see how we trade, how our suppliers work. A lot of the time, it's still, you know, you pick up the phone. You, you can buy millions of dollars worth of bullion. You still do it over the phone a lot of paperwork, a lot of signatures, transfer title in the vault takes time. It's all pretty slow. And some of the uh, um, initiatives of bringing more technology to our industry, not all of them succeeded. Even I remember seeing a nice presentation by a platform that unfortunately already been shut down. But after asking one of the ref big refiners in Switzerland, so what do you think about it? Like, I don't like it. We'll keep on picking up the phone and doing business this way. We wouldn't bother with the, te the technology. So that's one thing. Second thing is that we are physical people, right? We like the physical stuff. That's one of the reasons why we're in the industry. There's come all this conference about, about blockchains and, and, and ledgers and computers everywhere computing. That sounds a bit weird to us, at least to some of us, for sure to me. The second, I think another reason we're a bit uh, reluctant to look into this uh, uh, field is the fact that the cryptocurrencies are the, by far the most, let's say, important and, and visible application of the technology. And not all of us like cryptocurrencies. We have still, some of us still have the image of, uh, of dark net, of laundering money, of hiding money. Why would someone buy this if they're honest and good people? So all these kind of lead our, our, us to kind of look at it a bit more uh, suspiciously. Um, but there's more into it. I mean, we should look into this, and that's what I plan to do today. So I'm going to briefly go through what is blockchain technology, smart contracts, how it's been applied, and how can we in the industry uh, adopt it, or at least see if we can adopt it. 
So on the technological side, I'm not going to be, it took, it took me you know, a long time to understand. I had one of the young guys in my team kind of hammering my head with, with the facts until I managed to get it. At the end of the day, blockchain technology is a ledger system. It's a public ledger, it's decentralized, and it's based on consensus. So again, digital consensus-based ledger system. That's what it's all about. And the way it works is that once you come on the, on the platform, and there are different platforms, and of course that's one of the problems we're going to speak about later, and you ask to confirm a transaction, there's a peer-to-peer -peer computer system, and all of them just have to be consensus, a full consensus that transaction is real. That transaction can be a transfer of, of digits, like uh, cryptocurrencies, it can be a photo, it can be a certificate, it can be documentation, it can be approvals, to do an action, it could be many things. And this is encrypted and tied up. Once there's a consensus that this transaction is real, it's all tied up to a block, to call a block. And this block is being attached to the previous block, and it will be the basis for the next block, hence the blockchain. So at the end of the day, you have a temper evident ledger. And once it's recorded, once there was a consensus, between all the participants that this transaction is genuine, you cannot alter it. And that's where one of, one of the major strengths of, of this technology comes from. Smart contracts, that's another term we need to get familiar with. These are basically programs that reflect a real contract. So there's a, there's a real contract with terms and condition, and it's been put digitally in a program the block, using the blockchain technology. And again, one of the advantages of this technology is there's no third party. You don't need a third party to authenticate it because if there's a consensus within the system that this, the terms are, were actually uh, achieved, the terms were met, then the contract is, is, it can be executed. So if you look on the, uh, on the advantages of, of using this technology, one of them is transparency, because again, it's public. So you can see what's, what's happening. You can always log on and see what's going on. Even today, if you're talking about, again, going back to cryptocurrencies, you can see addresses of wallets, and you can see how much cryptocurrency they hold, because that's public. You don't know who's behind the wallet, but you can still know whether this wallet is there and how much cryptocurrencies they keep. The same with any other application of this technology. It's transparent. It's secure because you can't tamper with it. Again, once there's a consensus, once there's understand that there's agreement that, that the transaction is genuine, this is it. You cannot change it. It allows us traceability and, of course, speed and efficiency, which can lead to reduced costs. Now, all these advantages can be applied very nicely to um, uh, supply chain management. And because we can eliminate fraud, we can reduce errors, and because we can manage inventory better. So think from, again, from our point of view, think of material living from the mine, being shipped for uh, uh, refining, sent to the other side of the world, ending up as an end product that being transported, that being stored somewhere, being traded, moving to another location. If you think of all these features of the technology, in theory, all this could be tracked and all this could be done using this technology. So think how many, just think how many from, uh, uh, from the mine to the, uh, to the investor, how many hands, how many ledgers are, being, are, getting, are involved in this? How many different, we have regulatory, we have legal, again, we have transportation. All this can be traced and tracked on the blockchain. So when we look more specifically on our industry, and the bullion industry, so the first application comes to mind is the traceability. Whether we can trace the material from the mine all the way for the, uh, to the refinery. And there are two interesting uh, projects that are trying to do something similar. One of them is cobalt uh, mining in the DRC. So you probably know cobalt is what we use on all our electronic devices. It's what we need today, really, for day-to-day -day, um, um, use of every device, every digital device that we have. And the problem is it's mined in the DRC, 
and that about 20% of the mined cobalt is done in unauthorized mines. So there's a pilot now approved by Amnesty, approved by the World Economic Forum, and basically saying once you vet a mine, they can bring the bag to the collection uh, uh, point. They have a, a device, they can scan it, they can take a picture of it, they put the weight. The people on the ground and the organization, that, that will be their job. Approve this comes from the right mind and been given a tag and been recorded on the blockchain. Now this bag goes to the buyer and go and start moving up the supply chain and you can track it and every part, every station, every stop in its route will be re is recorded on the blockchain. That's one of the pilot that has been doing now. A second is what we call the trust chain, and this uh, platform is developed by IBM. So IBM is putting a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of stakes in blockchain technology and its applications. I think they have today about 2,000, 2,500 people working only on, under a blockchain uh, um, uh, subsidiary. And what trust chain is doing is basically using IBM technology and connecting Asai and Rio Tinto and Hertzberg retail jewelers and a couple of other players in the industry to be able to track the uh, material for jewelry. So mostly diamond and gold and, and other precious metals and being able to track these from the moment they, from where they came all the way to the shop in, in New York or wherever. So that's a pilot that has been going on. Again, the running pilot, it's not operational yet, but it shows you where it's heading. So the idea is if you go into a jewelry store and you buy you buy a diamond ring, you can tell that the gold came from a good source. You can tell the diamond, of course, is not a blood diamond. It came from a good source. And also, you save a lot of costs in the middle. So that's another interesting project. So apart from traceability, another application is documentation. We just, I just read uh, uh, yesterday, um, again, IBM and their project called TradeLens. They tracked a delivery of container flowers from Africa to the port of Rotterdam. There were over 200 communications back and forth about the shipment. So they opened what's called trade lens, basically saying, again, every step of the way, instead of start sending emails and bill of lending and all this documentation that, that we know quite well, instead everything will be approved through ecosystem, guaranteeing the custom clearance, the government's, the shipping companies, they're doing it with, uh, uh, with Marsk, one of the biggest uh, shipping, container shipping company in the world. Everything will be recorded on the blockchain. So basically you can track it all the way. You can know, okay, my shipment is, is leaving the port today. It's gonna be there tomorrow. I'm gonna send the track. You don't even need to get an email from the export department of that freight forwarding and start uh, uh, kind of starting the process. You know what's going on. So that's one project. Another project, by the way, they're doing with MIT is on medical documentation. So today, if you're looking off on clinical studies or even any medical documentation that is confidential, you can store it on the blockchain and let this documentation flow according to where the client is, where the uh, patient is, uh, is is moving. You can even have smart contracts. You can say that's their contract. If a certain terms are met this physician can have access to this information. So this, this MIT is doing this, again, it's all on a pilot base, but it, at least it can give us some ideas on, on where we're heading. And again, I know we're, we're, we're transporting uh, um, gold and, and silver globally, and we work with all the big uh, uh, logistic companies, and we know how difficult sometimes it is to handle the paperwork. And then you go to the custom clearance and all that. So what we're all trying to do is basically bring everyone on board on the same platform. Now, this is of course not perfect, not neither this nor the cobalt mining example I gave because at the end of the day we do have the human factor. We do have someone who needs to put this information in the system, right? So we still need to look at these guys and, uh, and with these guys that are putting the information in there. A very interesting, I think, uh, application and probably maybe one of the most, I would say, realistic, can be realistically achieved is the security of authenticity of the gold bar. That's relatively easy. So a refinery, once a refinery start uh, uh, refining a gold bar, they can put this information on the blockchain, the, the serial number, the purity, the weight. They can record the transportation company picking up this bar will record 
um, where they, you know, which, com which company picked up the date, where it's heading, then it's going into storage in the vault. The vault operator can provide information. Later it goes to the wholesaler, the retailer, and so on. Everything can be recorded. You can know at any given point where this bar came from and where it's heading. Um, I can tell you, we had a, um, in a couple of years ago, we liquidated quite a large amount of uh, a tonnage of silver for one of our clients. It was done, you know, tens of, uh, of uh, tons of silver. And we issued a problem because once we sold one of the silver bars, one of the vault operator called us and said, listen, London rejects this gold bar. I said, why? I said, why are they rejecting the gold bar? We bought it from a good delivery, LBMA approved refinery. It, was, it remained in the ecosystem throughout its way. Why aren't you accepting it back? Like, because the refinery didn't notify the LBMA, they, they changed the, uh, the details, or they, the, sorry, they, they changed the format of the numbering of the bars but they didn't notify the LBMA. So from selling good delivery bars at a certain discount, we ended up selling scrap silver and about to lose quite a substantial amount of money. And again, these things are, are classic for, for uh, to be solved with this technology because if there was a blockchain technology with a registry that is tamper-proof, that every, there's a consensus, there'll be no issues. They'll take, it, they'll take it back. Any company will take it back. Any refinery will take it back, and that would be easy. So that's one of the reasons the LBMA published uh, what they call um, uh, request for proposals. They want to start implement this both from a, a gold responsible gold initiative point of view, but also to make sure everyone knows that the bars are real, the bars are authentic throughout their chain, throughout the transportation. To me, that's probably one of the most uh, uh, promising project or promising application of technology in, in the bullion industry. Speed, yeah, and we work with banks both individually and as businesses. We know how long it takes to wire money. We, lo we, we, we know how long it takes to, uh, we can work on operating hours and so on. So speed can be, uh, 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 can be more efficient if you use either cryptocurrency settlement or other pro blockchain protocols, the protocol called Ripple, that is, is based, is, is the implementation is for uh, at transferring um, and clearing of funds. That, that's a, one of the major things it could do very quickly, unlike big Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies. So that's a protocol called Ripple. But even from a, just a banking point of view, I mean, we had a client that had been selling metal steadily, and we, st we wired him the proceeds to his bank in North America. But then when they said, listen, I want to start getting it in cryptocurrencies, then we looked at the time, I've been processing time of two business days and fees of $80 per transaction, as we're doing it on a regular basis. We moved down to processing time of 20 minutes and fees of $10. So just, just for that, that's something we already use. That's what we do in our new company, the crypto division. And that's what our clients are looking at. They're looking at speed. They're looking at a way to transact quicker on weekends and so on. The last application I'm going to mention is what I call the holy grail of the cryptocurrencies, and that's a gold-backed token. And that's, uh, that's, uh, there's a lot of hype around it. I think we, said we wrote here 20 projects. I think there are over 30 projects now. I think at least two or three uh, people that run similar projects are, should attend, are attending this conference. And the idea is very simple. Issue cryptocurrency, so use the technology to issue a token that is based on an actual unit of gold physical gold stored somewhere. It can be most, most companies are doing about one gram. Some are doing fractured ownership. Some are looking at, at whole units of one gram. And the ideas are two. First of all, you give accessibility to people who cannot buy gold otherwise. Because you do it in, in, in small, uh, uh, lower denominations. And do it something digital. They can buy it from their, their uh, uh, platform, from their mobile phone, anything like that. And you give the cryptocurrency community something that addressed their concern, giving them a stable coin that is backed with physical uh, asset. Because, and, and, and we heard about this before, and we all know it, the cryptocurrencies are very volatile. Now, when cryptocurrency clients want to move back to stable asset, if they're small, they move back to gold. That's, the, that's a lot of the work we're doing with crypto investors. But most of them put their money in what's called USDT, USDT uh, uh, Tether, which is a cryptocurrency supposedly pegged to the US dollar, but it has no 
backing or let's put this, their claim it's not fully backed with US dollars, but they don't have this stable asset. They can quickly convert through an exchange, park their money in something less volatile, and move back to crypto when they want to do that. So these two measures are what this gold-backed token can, be, uh, uh, can uh, achieve. Personally, we looked at a few of the, of the uh, projects. We haven't seen a project that, that we really liked. And uh, to full transparency, we even looked at doing one ourselves. The problem with these projects of the gold bag tokens is, one, the first ones was not coming, were not initiated by people from our industry. Most of it came from the tech side. So one of the most promising projects, it took them two and a half years. They raised about $10 million. And after two and a half years, they had 400 grams of gold in the vault. And the reason it took them two and a half years to learn what's gold, how to buy it, how to store it, how to audit it, kind of to learn what people in our industry know already. So either they come from the tech side or they come from the bullion side, but they want quick cash. They want what you call ICO, initial coin offering. They want to raise, I just read one, one of the projects just claimed they raised $60 million. Another one just saying they're going to raise $120 million. I can tell you, when, look, when you, we looked at doing something similar ourselves and our and one of our potential partners, how much money you want to raise? I don't know. We don't, what are we going to do with $50 million? What are we going to do? I buy a yacht, maybe. I don't know. But we need to do it for their project, right? So that's the second problem. And the third problem that we couldn't find a project that we like is that it's overcomplicated. They want to give you yield sometimes. They want to do different things that are not necessarily related to gold. Gold doesn't give yield unless you, you take a loan against it. And invest in something else. But as, as an asset, it's very difficult asset to start ge to try to generate yield and how you charge the storage cost and, and whether now there's the question is whether it's a security token. So you need to regulate it and so on and so on. There's a lot of issues around it. And so far, we couldn't find a project that we said, these guys got it right. So to conclude, um, it's good technology. We shouldn't be afraid of it. Leave cryptocurrencies aside. You may like or may not. If you like it or not, we can discuss on Friday in my next presentation about cryptocurrencies. But let's look at, from a technological point of view. The blockchain is a promising technology. It could cut down costs. It could cut down processing time. It could provide more assurance and more uh, security for our industry. Now. Deloitte just published, I think, two days ago, a report saying what prevents blockchain from becoming very, uh, become a, a very uh, uh, common technology. And what they said is one of them is that there's no, uh, the companies don't speak with each other. There's no standardization of the, on the technological side. There are regulatory issues, so there's a lot of money that's being spent from different players trying to, you know, trying to set the standard, set the rule. And this is why I think for us, actually from the bullion industry, we have a chance here. Because at the end of the day, and, and I look actually at the office said that the LBMA may, may be as, some, as the organization that can help us adopt. Because the LBMA has a good standing, they monitor anyway, they monitor the market, right? So they can set the rules. They can say, okay, from now on, apart from the specs of these bars, you know, this purity, this way, these dimensions, this is what you put on the bar. We will also want you to use this platform to implement those uh, um, specs, this software that safeguard our industry. Because the LBMA can actually solve the problem that Deloitte is pointing out, the lack of standardization and so on. So I hope the uh, uh, LBMA, they finish the uh, RFP, I think, in end of October. They're not the quickest organization in the world. They, they take their time usually. And they are very conservative. but. On the authenticity of the bars, on documentation, transportation, for sure the technology could be good for us. Other stuff, such as mining, I don't know. For me, I find it hard to believe that if you go in the mine, uh, let's say again, in, in, in Ghana, all these places, I have a feeling not necessarily the bag you're going to put there and tag as a bag from a good audited miner is actually from a good miner. I'm not sure how the custom will. You make sure that the custom officer doesn't push the wrong button when you get, you know, when you get uh, uh, this bag of, of uh, um, alluvial gold and so on. So when, as more as we involved kind of the downstream, kind of the, the mines, the more difficult jurisdiction, 
it will be tough. It will be tough, and then maybe you're not going to save money because we end up, if you're going to end up sending monitors to monitor how they bring the gold in, we didn't achieve anything. But surely, closer to an investor, closer to the refiner, closer to the LBMA ecosystem, I think we have a good chance of implementing this, and we should do it sooner rather than later. So thank you. I think we have maybe one minute if uh, someone asks any questions. Ah, sorry. Gentlemen. So what are the major? Yeah, so, so I said, they're over 20 now. And, and actually, every two days, I read a new one. And there was a famous one, but they, I mean, the, the most known one was from the Royal Mint in the, in the UK, and, and that didn't succeed. The reason, again, either they don't come from the industry, they come from the technological side, or they're overcomplicated, trying to guarantee yield and issuing you know, too many tokens and so on. Uh, or sometimes I feel, and, and that's general in the ICO, that's not, nothing relevant to this project, is sometimes the ICO, especially now, it's just about making money, frankly. So you look at it and say, why do you need $150 million? What would you do with $150 million? Which could do it for, I know how much the technology costs, it costs a million. Why do you need 150, right? So that's kind of the second question. Yeah, I, but I'm, I'm not sure about that they the issue actually cryptocurrency. I mean, they, they've, they've been allowing clients to spend their gold and, 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 and store it and buy it and, and to the retail market. I know them very well. I mean, I, I know of them. But it's, it's not the same as, as, as those gold-backed tokens. What they did, they tried to look into a credit card and so on, and they're a good company. Um, we don't like the, the, of course, we don't like, and we handle one of the upper over, our clients usually spend over $200,000. So we don't like the fractured ownership model. That's something we're against. But, you know, it, it's good for the retail market. So that, that's good. Thank you very much.